What's up, it's your boy the Notorious Mix back again with another video after about a million years. Yeah, I know. I'm not the most consistent with my uploads. I've been trying to fix that up, but I've really sucked at it. Anyway, I'm going to be doing my 2020 NRL season predictions. Now, before I get into the actual ladder and finals and all of that, I'm going to give you my prediction on three kind of not so much names you would think about that I think you should look out for this season, as in players. Each one I've selected from a different team. So, he goes. My first player that I'm mentioning is Raymond Fratala Mariner from the Bulldogs. Now, I think the Bulldogs have a lot of good talents in their team that are worth looking out for this season, but I feel like Fratala Mariner is a guy who could be one of the best second rollers in the comp or there and thereabouts with how the Bulldogs play, because I've noticed that, I mean, he seems like a good enough forward, he make, you know, you a few decent metres, and, you know, does his, puts his shift in, and on top of that, when the Bulldogs attack, especially down their left-hand side, Fratanga Marina is one of their better weapons, so he could get a few tries under his belt, and, yeah, Fratanga Marina is a shout, I think, to be one of the players to look out for this season. The second player I've got on this list is of the South Sydney Rabbitohs, Alex Johnston. Now, he's been playing fullback the last few years with South Sydney, or last while anyway, since they shifted Greg Inglis into the centres. Now, now with the signing of Latrell Mitchell, you would assume, given what he wants to do, what he's saying he wants, he will probably get a run at fullback which means that Johnson will have to be either out of the team or shifted on the wing. Going with the latter case in which he's shifted on the wing, and I think that's the more likely outcome anyway, go back a few, like five, six, seven seasons, or when South Sydney were finals every year and they had won that 2014 title, how good was Johnston on the wing? He was so lethal, he was scoring 20 plus tries a season, He's, he was lethal on the wing, and I think that if he gets shifted out there again, he could be a real weapon for South Sydney this season. Alex Johnston, my second of three players who are kind of quite under the radar that you should keep an eye on this season. And my third nominee is Kyle Flanagan. Now, we know that with um, the Sydney Roosters, along with Latron Mitchell, they've lost Cooper Cronk, which means that their main linchpin half will be Luke Kiry who I think, along with my Parramatta man, Mitchell Moses, is the best halfback in the competition. Um, But the thing with Kiri is, I, especially if you take last season into account, he's somewhat injury-prone. Like, I don't think he'll make it through the whole season. I think he could have a six, seven-week spell like he did last season where he's out injured. And someone's going to need to step up in the halves for the Roosters' side when Kiri's out, especially given that they don't have Kronk playing the number seven role. So, Kyle Flan and you know, Kyle Flanagan's played for the Sharks the season two. I've seen him in a couple of games. Looks a really promising player. You know, decent game management, shows a good bit of attacking creativity, good goal kicker. Flanagan could turn some heads this season. I think he's going to have a pretty good year, or he could, you never know, I mean, it's a gamble to say that, but Cole Flanagan, keep an eye on this kid, so they're my three players to really keep note of that, I don't think you're going to, he mentioned much else, to be honest, like, I could say, oh yeah, keep an eye on Latron Mitchell going to the Rabbitohs, oh yeah, keep an eye on Moses this season, he was the best halfback last year, arguably, or keep an eye on Valentine Holmes, or Kane, Kane and Ponga, or something, which is, like, the most obvious, you know, they're, they're very obvious choices, you know. I'm trying to go more under the radar. So, Raymond Fratanga Mariner, Alex Johnston, Kyle Flanagan. They're my three to keep an eye on this season. Now, we go into my ladder and finals predictions. I'm going to go from the bottom up for the ladder. In 16th place, I'm going to go with the West Tigers. They have lost a fair few players since last season. You know, notably the likes of Isan Masters, Ryan Madison, and a fair few more as well. I can't remember off the top of my head. I think 
is Harrington retire or something like that? Or Lawrence, whatever his name is. But anyway, I just they've lost a fair few players, like I said. And they while they've been there and thereabouts challenging a few every you know, most years, they've never really been a massive threat to the top eight. And I don't know, I just don't have a good feeling about this season, to be honest with you. For the ti Tigers, you know. The only real positive I see about them, like, or upgrade, is that they've got Joey Langua, but if they can't really consistently play good footy and create good chances for him, then are you really going to get much attacking use out of him? Like, you know, I, I obviously, yeah, the Raiders, but they had a massive forward pack laying the platform. Josh Hodgson, you know, doing a lot of work at a dummy half. Blake Austin, you know, in previous season, been playing good when Lane has been firing. And in last season, Jack Wyden, you know, with, you know, Cesar and Kurt Baptiste or whoever it was jumping in the halves, you know, in the halfback role. So I just don't think he has that same talent around him to be able to create chances which he can then go and finish or. I mean, he might help him yardage-wise, but beyond that, I don't know what impact Langua can have. I just don't think it's going to be the best season for the Tigers. In 15th, I have a really, really controversial one to some people, Panthers. I mean, I think people could see Panthers not making the eight because they've lost a fair few players. That is definitely a factor. Another factor is Ivan Cleary has had some bad seasons at the Panthers. He's had some decent ones, but bad ones too in terms of getting him like ladder positioning. On top of that, I just don't think Cleary is a guy. Like I, what I look at halfbacks and halves in you know the competition. A lot of the top halves have multiple elements to their game. Are well rounded, you know. Like, say you know probably my favorite player at the moment, just obviously because I'm a Parramatta fan, Mitchell Moses. His game management has developed, so he can manage a game. His general kicking is pretty good. On top of that, solid. You know, very, very good creative half, you know, with his passing range, his attacking kicks, you know, he's a well-rounded half. You look at Luke Kiri, very similar sort of thing. Great game manager, great key player, great attacking creativity, you know. Danny Cherry Evans, another example of that. Or if you want to go more the number seven, more similar to Kiri, Adam Reynolds, but, you know, more consistent, shows a bit more, you know, creativity, although he doesn't have, you know, with his selective passing. I forgot to mention it about Moses as well, his running game. But, yeah, Adam Reynolds Wong is very different in that sense, maybe not as multi-pronged as some of those other halves. He's still multi-pronged because he does try to take on the line when he can. He's got good passing range, very, very good kicking. So he's got multiple aspects to his game. Cleary can pass okay, can kick well, you know, in just like the general coming out of his own end in the middle. Um, decent defensively, but his attacking, you know, creativity compared to the light, you know, the other halves I mentioned, I just don't think it's there. I think he's just too flat, root one, uh, like flat heart. He's just too flat with what he plays. And he doesn't have a guy like Maloney next to him this season to bang him out and help him. You know, I don't, just don't. I mean, Appy Coruscant could be interesting to their attack, but yeah, I just don't think Cleary has that attacking ca that capability, and they've lost a lot of experienced players too. Even though, so I just think it's going to be one of those poor seasons for the Panthers. Fifteenth. I mean, I mean, I'll probably be wrong with that one, but I just you gut feeling it's just going to be a poor season for them. In fourteenth, they have the Titans. Now, look, they were originally, when I tried to do this letter at first, my wooden spooners, but I learned a bit more about what the Tigers gone through and just hunch on the Panthers. But as well, you're getting a little bit of English influence and talent coming in with the coach, Justin Holbrook. And on top of that, they do have the odd game where they can play decent footy and cause problems. And I think that with a bit of positivity around the club, you never know, they could string a couple or more wins together and might just get off the absolute bottom of the ladder. I don't think they're going to be much, they'll be in that bottom four, but it could show improvement from last season. So 14th, the Titan, Titans, Gold Coast Titans. In 13th, it's going to be the Warriors. Now, 
for me, the Warriors are just going to be like every season. From anywhere from 8 to 16, from 9 to 16, you know, show shot, show signs. We've got a decent team. They've lost Isaac Luke, but Cody Nikarima can slide in at the number 9. So I don't think there's going to be much different there. And having the likes of RTS and you saw, you're surely not going to be 16th, like, you know. But at the same time, I could see him in that bottom bottom four, like 12th, 13th, something like that. So I'm just going to go 13th for the Warriors. In 12th, I've got the Dragons. I think that it might help them that they're not going to be changing and rotating so much week to week with their spine. They might have a bit more consistency to them. And you never know if the Bellin, I don't know what the situation is with him, but if the Bellin can kind of get back in, they could be having looking at one of the top forwards in the comp. But Gareth Widdop was so key to that side. Was so key to that side that, you know, I think losing him for the whole season is just going to be an absolute, absolute blow to them. You know? Because he's going to Super League, I think. So he won't be there anymore. Massive blow to the Dragons. And, I mean, you never know. Ben Hunt has a bit of talent about him, I guess. I don't, I don't see him as one of the top halves in the comp. But when he when he plays well, he's asked questions. He's up there. And being a Parramatta fan and seeing what Corey Norman, that season he had in 2016, up until the whole thing with Sergi Aro and whatever else, he could play well too. So in the halves, they got two players who, while not on the best of form, could definitely turn it on. Both have origin experience. Uh, Isaac Luke could help with general experience. Cameron McInnes, you know, you got like the likes of... You never know. I mean, they got some decent players, the Dragons, and they could ask questions, but I just doubt what they'll do without Gareth Widdop. And I don't know if the players will be able to hit their best really under McGregor, so it's 12th with the Dragons. 11th place, I'm putting the Sharks. They've got some good players, but I think losing Kyle Flanagan will be a blow because he's probably their best goal kicker. So resorting to Sean Johnson, who's a so, he's a good player, but I don't think he has a, enough consistency to him and his goal kicking's a bit awry. Same with Chad Townsend, not really a full-time goal kicker, although a pretty good halfback. Losing Paul Gallen, a captain, a leader, really experienced player. And not having, I mean, Moylan's a pretty good player, but not having anyone who you look at and think, wow, that's a really, really good player. I just think Cronulla, that could be a solid team. They've definitely asked some questions and put in some performances, but I just don't think they've got enough quality to be in the top eight. In 10th place, the Bulldogs. I see this as a team that won't make the top eight, but they won't be a million miles away. Toward the back end of last season, they showed some signs, and they looked like you never know. They might actually scrape the top eight, like you thought had one or two conspiracy theories like that. And they have some good young talent there. Like I mentioned before, the likes of Raymond Fratanga Mariner, you know? And on top of that, look at their halves. Lachlan Lewis, Jack Cogger, if you can get four and having a consistent season, assuming he resigns. Hopper Whitey was one of the better setters in the competition. Dallin Watteni Zalesniak, Nick Meany. There's talent there. I mean, I think there's still gaps that they need to fill in. Like, you need some, maybe one or two players in that back line who are solid tries. Was like a Mike Acevo, like how Parramatta got, had Red Rider and Sivo or something like that. So they, they just need one or two of those guys that can absolutely finish and get you 20 plus tries a season. If the Bulldogs get that and they get maybe another one or two forwards to solidify that pack, they're a genuine top eight threat. They're a couple of players away from it, I think. They're not, a, you know, so... And I think that they could threaten. So I'll put them in 10. In ninth place, I'm putting the Cowboys. Now, just missing on the eight, I do think they have the talent to ask a lot of questions of that top eight. You have... My likes of Jason Taumalongo, who's been one of the best yardage power forwards in the competition. On top of that, you've got Michael Morgan, who shows a lot of you know attacking threat to his game. And Valentine Holmes has just come into the side as well. So there's definitely quality in that team to be in the eight. But the problem is, I don't who who's really gonna I don't think they have a number seven who's gonna be good enough to consistently week to week be the man to guide that team around the park and 
really take control. I don't think Morgan has it in him to do that every week, week in, week out. I mean, some games he can, but some games he won't. And I think he needs to be freed up to be playing as a fullback or a running 5'8". Like, and have a proper halfback in that team next to him. That, I just think... And because of that reason, I just don't think they'll have the stability week to week to be able to be in that top eight. If they had a good halfback, they could be fifth, sixth, fourth, you know, with the quality that they have in their side. But lacking that number seven is really going to hurt them, I think. I mean, they've got some young prospects. I can't remember his name exactly, but they had a decent number seven last season. But you can't put all the weight on the shoulders of a kid like that. It's like... If Moses wasn't a game manager, I'd go back to Parramatta a lot because I know more about them than anyone else in the comp. Like, if Moses didn't have the game management to his side and he was just a creative attacking half, then you would be relying on Dylan Brown every week. You know what I mean? And because he's so young, that would be kind of problematic. That's the Cowboys situation now with Michael Morgan. Because I don't know if week to week he'll be able to manage every single game because I think he's not really a number seven. He's a number one slash six. So, yeah, I just for that reason, they're not going to have the stability to be in the eight. In seventh, I'm going with the Broncos. I don't think that they have the, ex- the thing that they've got a lot of talent in that side. And you know what? From second to seventh, I think will be like a top four battle in a way. All of these sides will be pretty close to each other in terms of quality. But of that pool... I'm going to go with the Broncos as the worst of them, just because I think, I'm not sure about the experience in that side, how experienced that they'll be, because they're going to rely on a few youngsters coming through. Brody Croft, will he be the answer at number seven? He could, he might not. Will Milford be able to get some consistency in his game? Will, I mean, who's going to be, like, the likes of Asako, is he going to be, a consistent threat. How good's Jordan Carhu going to be coming back in? Will Corey Oates get them a 20-plus try season like he did toward the start of his career? You know, Turpin, Dearden, who's going to be the hooker? You know, things like that in terms of their backs, really, mainly. So your halves and your back five, where is where I'm not really sure about Brisbane, but they could, but I think... They've got more depth than the other sides I mentioned previous to them. And if the young forwards can click, you know, the likes of Payne Haas and uh, Pangai Jr., Offen Gowie, what's his name, Matt Lodge, th- those type of forwards get clicking. They're a tough, tough side, you know. That's what I. Th- that's why I think... Based on their forward pack, I could see them as a solid seventh. I think they're just a bit off, actually, the other teams above them from six to two. But they could, they can definitely ask some questions if they get consistently their best football. In sixth, I've got the Sea Eagles. Now, I actually think, I'm kind of like a spoiler, the Sea Eagles are probably my favourites to be a premiership contender. Because in a one-off game, playing, you know, I think the Sea Eagles are probably top two or best side, one of. But what I think has put them down a few places from where I was... Because when I originally did this letter, I had the Seagulls a solid second. But what I think has dropped them for me is, one, they've lost Koros out. So one less option for the number nine. And two, no Kane LG, no Trent Hodkinson, which means that if any injuries occur in halves... They're, not gonna, they're lacking the depth that they had their last season. Hodkinson is not like the top halfback in the comp, but he comes in and consi- he'll be a consistent sort of, you know, just stable. He'll get your fifth tackle kick. He can convert. Just things like that, you know, just a stable half. And they don't have that now. And they don't have Kane LG either, who wasn't the best, not the worst. You know, so say something happens to Cherry Evans, who have they really got that's going to, control that team from the halves or control that team on a ball playing Jake Draboyevich he's a forward come on you know I mean he's a great ball player but he's a forward he's not a half so I got the single six just because I think depth in the halves is going to be a problem for them now fourth and fifth I'm going to talk about together 
because this was such a toss up. This was the biggest toss up for me. It was one of the hardest things to place. In fifth, I have the Roosters, and in fourth, I have the Eels. Now, the reason I originally thought Roosters fourth, because obviously I think Kiri, they've got one of the best halves in the comp, and minus Natural Mitchell and Kronk, they still have the same side pretty much. It's won the Premiership two years in a row. So they're a very good team on their best day. But, like I said again, as good as Kyle Flanagan is, and I think he will be one to look out for, and he could, you know, have a good season. You can't put all your eggs in the basket and say, "Yep, Kyle Flanagan's going to do a mad job if Kiri gets injured." You know what I mean? Whereas with Parramatta, although it's a similar situation, are you really going to rely on Dylan Brown to govern the side around and be the best half in the comp when Moses is injured? But and I'll probably just jinx it by saying this, but then again, Kiri has those periods of six or seven weeks where he's out. Moses played every game for Parramatta last season, you know? I, he's in the side more consistently than Kiri because he's less injury-prone than Kiri. So due to more stability in the halves, that leans it toward Parramatta. And because we have that intimidation factor at Bankwest Stadium, which will help, which will help with our consistency, which is something we sorely need, help with the consistency. But then again, I still, you know, even though, so I will have Parramatta fourth and Roosters fifth, but where Roosters have a chance is Parramatta, I just don't know if we've gotten over those one or two weeks in the comp yet where we get 50 or 60 pull past us, like Melbourne 64 to 6, or 64 nil, whatever that game was. Absolutely ridiculous to have that happen to you. But yeah, I mean, we've lost some players and we've replaced them with quality. Ryan Madison in for, like, Ma'u. You know, youngsters will probably come through in the forwards to replace players like Maroa. Regan Campbell-Gillard will come in prop, obviously filling that space left for Mana If he gets his, rediscovers his origin form, we could be talking a serious player here, you know? So... You know, Parramatta top four and Roost is fifth just because what happens if they lose Mitchell? Well, they lost some of the, I'm not Mitchell Keary. So that's why I, so I'm going Roost is fifth, Parramatta fourth, third. I'm going to go the Canberra Raiders. I think that they will be right up there this season as another big contender for the Premiership. They've still got their same solid forward pack. Josh Hodson at the number nine. Jack Wyden still was threatening. As ever, Nick Klockstad fullback, Jack Croker in the centres, no Lang Lua, but I think they'll manage. So, again, very tough side. They've got a new number seven. I think it was Sam, was it Sam Williams that they got from over in England. I don't know enough about their number seven to say how good or bad he is. I haven't seen a lot of Super League. But <laughs> I think that they'll be stable... They'll be in the top four again, and they'll be one of the better teams this season. But I don't know if the number seven is going to be good enough to really give enough control and stability to that side to really be the top. That's what I think that they were missing. You know, if they had a top number seven, they would have won the premiership last season. But because they don't, they didn't last season, that's why I think they fell short, and they might just fall short there again this season, depending on how good this English halfback they've got is. In second place, I've got the South Sydney Rabbitohs. I think out of all of these contenders I've listed for the top four, I'm not going to put the Broncos in there, actually. I think they're a bit off, but the Seagulls, the Roosters, Para, Raiders, and themselves, they've got the most well-rounded and complete side. In the forwards, they've lost one of the... Sam's retired, and one of the twins has gone over to the Super League. But they've got the likes of Jai Arrow in, so that'll help them. Natrell Mitchell will be a massive attacking threat. As well, I mentioned Alex Johnston in my players to look out for. I actually think that that could happen. He could have a 20 plus, 20 try plus season because out on the wing, I think he's proven that he can do that. And Wayne Bennett as a coach, I think can make this team one of the most consistent teams in the competition. So deservedly in second place for me. 
But first place, and well, I will actually mention Rabbitohs are probably a premiership contender. And in first place, you'll know who I'm going to say, Melbourne Storm. I don't think they're one of the biggest premiership contenders in the comp. I think any of those teams from six to second, from six to two, on their best day, could beat Melbourne. So I don't think Melbourne will win the premiership. But in a 25-round season, Melbourne have more than any other team in the competition by a significant amount consistency. Like I said about Parramatta, they have those one or two games where they can put get 50 or 60 put past them. The Roosters, one injury down, they can be absolutely screwed. Um, you know, the Rabbitohs, Adam Reynolds gets injured for half the season, so then they're lacking a number seven, and they have, or players are fatigued from state of origin, so then all of a sudden they go into their shell for two weeks, the Raiders, what happens when Josh Hodgson is injured? How good are their halves? Blah, 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 blah. The Seagulls, what happens if Cherry Evans is misfiring or injured? and They go into two or three game losing streak. That doesn't happen to Melbourne. It, that's the thing. All those teams will have those slumps of form somewhere in the season or those couple of games that don't go well. Melbourne, that doesn't happen to them. They Yeah, okay, they will lose a couple of games here or there. Because, what well, I don't think there's a side that's gone perfect in the NLC. So I'm not sure. But, they, they're like a machine. They're more consistent than anyone else in this competition by a great margin. I think that when it comes to the finals, though, you will get teams like, you know, the Roosters, the Eagles, Sea Eagles, Raiders, even Parramatta, even Brisbane, you know what I mean? The other top eight teams will find an extra gear, whereas Melbourne will stay at the level that they are, which is why I don't think Melbourne will win the Premiership. I, th But for the regular season part, they will win the minor Premiership, in my opinion. So Melbourne Storm first. Now, I'm going to go into the finals layout. I'm not sure if this is a correct layout for how the finals work, I've got first versus fourth, based on my ladder predictions, Storm versus the Eels. Now, because Melbourne are first in these predictions, they will have the home advantage. So I'm, I'm predicting that Parramatta will have a closer game with them than last year when we lost like 32 or 36 new or whatever that was. That was a diabolical game. But... I'm predicting 22 to 12 Melbourne will win. I think that Parramatta will give them a good challenge and ask questions, but Melbourne will have, be really solid defensively. May leak one or two tries, but have a good defensive game and just have it to beat Parramatta. So 22 12 Melbourne, especially because it'll be at Amy Park as well. So Melbourne advance straight to week three, and Parramatta go to week two. And they will play the winner of five versus eight. Roosters versus Knights. And I also forgot to mention with... Did I even mention that Knights would be 8th? Cowboys 9th, and I forgot to mention, yeah. Newcastle Knights, I've got them 8th. And I just think Mitchell Pearce, who's a solid enough halfback to control that team for enough of the season that they'll make the 8. And I think Ponga is going to have a breakout year this year. So, yeah. Newcastle Knights 8th, if I forgot to mention that. So, the Roosters versus the Knights... I've got them as five versus eight. And I think the Roosters will just win it convincingly 28 to eight. I mean, these games are actually hard to predict score-wise because it depends who's available, who's not available. There's a lot of factors that we don't know at this point. But yeah, Roosters versus Knights, 28 to eight. Roosters are just a much better side. So they'll go to week two to play Parramatta at Bankwest. Now, the other top four game will be Rabbitohs at home playing the Raiders, according to my predictions. And I think that would be due to home advantage, and they just might be a bit better side. South Sydney will win 14-10, to 10, and then they go directly to Week 3, meaning the Raiders go to Week 2, Top 4 losers, up against the winner of the Seagulls versus the Broncos. Now, like I said, I think the Seagulls are solid contenders for Top 4 and solid contenders for Premiership glory this season. And Brisbane, whilst having quality, they're still a young side. And the, they may still have one or two holes that they need to fill. And things like consistency or whatever, they're still going to be learning. So I just don't think they have enough. 
to take on a side like Manly in the finals. So 26-10 Manly, they advance a second week to play the Raiders. The first of the two semi-finals will be Parramatta versus Roosters at Bankwest Stadium. I think because of the the players that Roosters have lost, the changes to Parramatta's squad, and the fact that it would be a Bankwest, Parramatta may just skin this game. 20 to 16. I'm not being biased. I think that that could happen. So Parramatta will beat the Roosters 20 to 16, according to my predictions, and go on to week three of the finals to play the Rabbitohs. And it'll be a home game for South Sydney. The second of those two games will be the Sea Eagles up against the Raiders. I think that, like I said about the Sea Eagles, on a one off occasion, like one off game where everyone plays at their best, the Sea Eagles are probably the best side in the comp. Or right up there. So I think they could just get a one-point victory over the Raiders. 13-12. Especially because it's that Brookie. Oh, no, it's not. Yeah, no, because Raiders are the top four side. It'd be at Canberra. But I still think Manly will get one point and just win it. So 13-12, Manly win. So then we are into the week three games. I will start off with the Storm and the Seagulls. I think Manly will steal it like they did in regular season in 2019. They will steal it in extra time by one point against Melbourne. Nine points to eight. The Seagulls will beat the Storm and make the grand final. And the second of the two of the prelim finals, the Rabbitohs versus the Eels. Rabbitohs home game. Like I said, I just think that it's a slightly more complete side and better than the rest of the top four contenders. Apart from, I think, Manly, who won a one-off day, could beat them. But... Yeah, i got to give it to the Rabbitohs because I don't think Parramatta, whilst the quality is there to push for it, I'm not sure if they yet have the mental strength to go all the way to a grand final or win a premiership. So I think that they could be just denied by South Sydney. So 14-12 South Sydney, which leads to a Seagulls versus Rabbitohs grand final, and I think Manly will win at 18-14. Therefore, your 2020 premiers, according to me, will be the Manly Seagulls. So, guys, I hope you enjoyed that prediction video. Um, drop it in the comments how you think this season will go and where your teams are going to be placed and, you know, who's going to win the premiership and that, obviously. So, yeah, and like I said, subscribe to the channel, leave a like if you like the video, leave your comments on your predict, you know, giving me your predictions and... Hopefully I can do more regular content for the NRL like I've been trying to, but I haven't really got it on a consistent basis. But yeah, to my week-to-week -week game predictions, and I'm trying to get that back for my channel this year. So yeah, hopefully I'll see you with those. And yeah, tell me what you think of the video, I guess. See you guys.